And I love the fact that they have kind of termed it young old. 65 to 84, your go-go years. Let's go out there. Let's do some stuff. Hopefully you're healthy. You're financially stable. You've got a good community, a good network. This should be your go-go years. Let's go enjoy that. Let's embrace that. Let's have fun. Welcome to Upticks with Jake Falcon, founder and CEO of Falcon Wealth Advisors. In this podcast, we help high net worth individuals overcome financial complexities. We do this by enhancing financial literacy and discussing topics in a language free from industry jargon. Join us as we help explain exactly what having a solid financial plan means as Jake draws from years of experience in helping hundreds of individuals get financially organized and focused on their goals. We hope you find Uptix educational, entertaining, and shareable. Now, on to the show. Welcome back to Uptix with Jake and Corey. Corey, welcome back to the show. Jake, thank you for having me. Corey, what's new in your life? There's not too much new in my life, Jake. We are, are actually, except for the fact that our daughter, Daisy, is three months old today. That's the big new and exciting news. Three months today. So we survived the, the first 90 days. Have sir. Now I hear from my friends that have babies that the progression on these things can happen rather rapidly. Mm-hmm. But maybe Daisy's not there yet. But is she done? Is she doing anything? I'm sure she's doing stuff she wasn't doing two months ago, but like, is she walking? Is she talking? Is she driving a car? What's going on? Yeah, I've been telling her it's time to get a job, but it is, um, (laughs) no, I think that we, yes, to answer your question, there is some fast development that's happened, for example, in the last week or so, she's really found her voice. So it's just more like babbling and talking, but she's trying to like, she'll mimic, right? What I'm saying or a noise I'll make or whatever it might be. Like she's learning the communication piece. And fortunately for Cassie and I, we've had two nights now no, three nights now that she slept through the night for us, which is, ah, uh, which is huge progress, congratulations. Uh, which is exciting. Yes. But that's Excellent. what's new. You know, I had some crazy, uh, I did a lot here. You know, normally I'm kind of a homebody and I work a lot. I'm around people a lot at work. So I like to kind of just be home by myself, but I've been busy socializing here lately. So uh, first off, I went, I know golf. I get it. I get it. I play a lot of golf. Everybody knows that. Or I went out to Maxwell, Nebraska, which is out in the Nebraska Sand Hills near North Platte. I played a brand new golf course called Gray Bull. Fantastic. I highly recommend if any of our listeners get the opportunity to go out there, they definitely should do it. It's one of these stay and play places. You're in the middle of nowhere, but they got you covered. Mm. You got beautiful golf. You've got all the food and drink that you want. It's a really good staff, very friendly and a lot of fun. I went out there with a group of guys that I go on golf trips with from time to time. So I had a great time there. Then I came back. I went to the Westport Art Fair. Have you ever been to the Westport Art Fair? A few years ago, yes. Not on purpose. We were just there when it was happening. <laughs> you were down in Kelly's and it just No, we were going to, to dinner, actually. I think it was at Westport Cafe. That French Anyways, place was, place was packed. Very good art fair, actually. I really enjoyed it. It was really crowded, though. Almost too crowded for me. Mm-hmm. Then I went to the Royals game and credit to those Royals, Corey. We're making a playoff push. Looks like they're going to make the playoffs. So thank you. You helped me get tickets. Took a client out to a Royals game. It was a lot of fun with Rachel. And you are now charged, Corey, with getting me playoff tickets. Okay. So All right. I want you to get me, you, Rachel, and Cassie. We got to go to a playoffs game. That'd be a lot of fun. So All right. I'll write it down. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Corey said he'd do it. Everybody he- heard it here first. Now, I want to, before we go into today's topics, Corey, I want to thank our audience. We've had, we've had a few listener suggestions, listener comments, things that they want to share. So again, if you have any questions or comments that you want me and Corey to address live here on Upticks, please email Luke at falconwealthadvisors.com. That's Luke, L-U-K-E at falconwealthadvisors.com. And Luke will make sure that we talk about your topic live here on Upticks. And please, if you are tuning in, five-star review, thumbs up, like, and share our content. The whole purpose of Uptix is to enhance financial literacy, Corey. This is not advice. This show is not advice, but we're hoping that our audience learns something that they can take to their unique situation or their financial plan and learn from. But again, we're not offering advice on the show. If you want advice, schedule time to meet with us, and we're happy to give you all the advice you need in there. Okay, so this is from a client, Corey, and... It's a little bit long, but I'll I'll read it here quickly. I I think it's an awesome article, and I'm glad that she shared it with me. This is from uh, Facebook, and the administrator said this. 
But basically, uh, they said, well, I had no idea that by 2034, U.S. citizens who are 65 years or older will probably outnumber those who are under 18 because of a greatly expanded life expectancies. Uh, he's talking about an article here. She uh, talks about the article that they cast this vision that but regardless of when we decide to stop full-time work, we dare not neglect the new opportunities for ministry in our families, communities, and churches in the latter years of our lives. If we are wise, we must consider how we can serve the Lord and his kingdom in the extra years he has graciously, graciously given us. What's interesting is the longevity here, Corey. The article says not long ago, this person visited their 99-year-old father and 97-year-old mother. And his dad had just passed his driver's test again. And a year before that, he published yet another book. Could you imagine that, Corey, in your 90s? I like it. He told me, this is from the author, he told me he wants to take up painting again. Then with a mischievous look in his eye, his dad turned to him, a 60-something baby booner, baby boomer, and said, son, what are you going to do with yourself? You've got your whole life ahead of you. A hundred years ago, this kind of comment would have seemed nonsensical, but the fact is a massive demographic shift is taking place in our country and Americans today are living longer than ever. U.S. hospitals and universities are now referring to the 65-plus life stage as a period of late adulthood, which they divide into three stages. The young adult is 65 to 84, or sorry, sorry, the young old is 65 to 84. The oldest old is 85 to 99, and the centurions are 100 plus. The young old stage is considered the golden years. I call those the go-go years, Corey, as you know, Mm -hmm. of adulthood with fewer responsibilities, relatively good health, and meaningful social engagement. Corey, what are your thoughts on Americans living longer? I think that it is very real. I like the overall from this article and the message behind it, I think is is a positive one. And I do think we also need to have more young, we, we need more younger people also. <laughs> uh, ultimately, the folks that are 65 or older are going to outnumber those that are 18 or younger. That's a whole other conversation. But uh, overall, I do like the point there. And I think that there's a lot of wisdom in that and really what is important for people late in life. And it sounds like, you know, anecdotally, what a Really, for a few people here, what has continued to give them purpose and drive well into their 90s, which we talk about on the show. Yeah, I love it. Again, retirement for some people is scary, rightfully so. From a financial perspective, I get it. That's what we help people with. Mm -hmm. But from a personal, I, I think that this country historically has done a bad job of honoring our wiser, older generations. And I love the fact that they have have kind of termed it, this article has at least young, old, right? 65 to 84, your go-go years. Let's go out there. Let's do some stuff. Hopefully you're healthy. You're financially stable. You've got a good community, a good network. This should be your go-go years. Let's go enjoy that. Let's embrace that. Let's have fun. That's what I liked about it too, is a very uplifting article in a sea of negative articles. So that's why I appreciate uh, the client sharing me with this. So Corey, what do you have? Yes. So I have a response here from a client. We talked about pet trusts, Jake, just a few weeks ago on the show. And the message here said, our current foster dog, Galaxy, was a dog picked up. Hold on. After- Hold on. Galaxy? What a strong name for a it dog. a strong dog name. Galaxy. I think, I think Einstein is awesome name. Galaxy? I'm not to share that with Rachel. All right, go on. Galaxy. What a cool You'll name. You'll name your next dog Universe. Okay. So, <laughs> Galaxy was a dog picked up after the owner died and got shipped to the Kansas City Pet Project because nobody was there to take care of the dog and he had no family. So the message here was if you have an animal, make sure the power of attorney or personal rep or executor knows, not just family, especially if you live alone. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that this client was able to adopt the dog. Yes, Absolutely. Good. And they, they chimed in here too, Jake, on the uh, credit cards. We talked about how many credit cards you have. Two personal, three business for two different businesses, and one for each spouse as far as the personal cards go, uh, with the goal of paying them off monthly, which we, of course, love to hear. Yeah, yeah, good. And thank you for sharing that. That's good. Fantastic, Corey. All right. Yes. I, I got one more for you. This is a good one. And again, I don't like to turn 
too political, but I'm not scared of talking about it either with you, Corey, as you know. Uh, this is from a listener and a client, so thank you again for sharing. Uh, here's what he said. I am listening to Upticks this morning, and I would like to share my thoughts on the generational differences in political views. In general, younger generations tend to lean more towards liberal ideologies. Am I saying that right? Ideologies. 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 Thank you, Corey. Compared yeah. to older generations. This can be attributed to the fact that when individuals are in their 20s, they often feel a sense of generosity and benevolence, which makes them more supportive of policies such as higher taxes and increased social benefits. However, as individuals accumulate assets and wealth, their mindset tends to shift towards conservatism, driven by the desire to protect and preserve what they have earned. He said, I think this has always been around. There are definitely free thinking hippies from the 1960s that ended up being very conservative. It happens. And I think this is fantastic perspective, Corey. I also think it has to do with your upbringing. I think if your parents have strong views and you agree with them, that also can influence you when you're younger. And then you maybe switch when you're older. But I want to ask you, Corey, have your ideologies, did I say that? Ideologies. 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 Have your ideologies changed as, Corey, you have gotten older and now you're a parent? Has it changed? It's changed some, but not a lot. It really hasn't. Okay. Okay. I think that the, to me, it feel, this is just my opinion, but the, the way that I feel about my own values and ideologies, et cetera, that I subscribe to is that you know, those things have remained relatively consistent. I, I, I think that what liberal and conservative or Republican and Democrat, whatever it might be, I think the, the definitions around those things are fluid and changing. But I, my perspective is that the, uh, the political landscape has changed a whole lot more than my ideologies have. Hmm. Interesting point. But I From do, my- I do understand the generational piece and I don't, I, I am generally speaking in agreement with that. And I know that that's just their perspective and we're talking, you know, a big group of people, but it does make perfect sense what the, what, what they're mapping out here. Right. Yes. Generally speaking, exactly. From my perspective, I don't identify with either party because I right. think it's a flawed system. Now I'm not saying that America is bad though. I don't think there is a perfect system. And as long as you're going to have humans involved, there's going to be issues and flaws and arguments and disagreements and mistakes and fraud and corruption and lies and all of that. Because they're humans. So humans do. Yep. So I probably identified with a party earlier in life because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. But that's before, Corey, and I'm older than you, but that's before it got so extreme. Right. I feel like America is very polarized today, and and that makes me want to affiliate with a party even less than I did before. Is it's, it's almost like uh, I root for the Royals or the Chiefs, but if somebody's a Cowboys or a Yankees fan, we typically like don't get into screaming matches or hate each other or fights or there's you know there's not violence typically. Sometimes I mean if you're a Raiders fan, maybe maybe sometimes it fights break out, but. <laughs> But my point is, that's how I think politics should be almost like rooting for your sports team, but it's gotten way deeper than that. And, and granted, it is probably more important than that. It is more important than that. But my issue is, I, I like to vote for the politician that makes sense and is rational. And the problem is that there's not many that do that. So that's why I can't affiliate with a party, because I, I see the flaw. I see the good, and I see the flaws in both parties. So it's very difficult for me. I think it also helps me though with perspective, but I, so I can, I can see pros and cons with both parties. I do. And I don't affiliate with either party. And I don't know if I'll, I don't know if that will change, frankly. I don't know. I don't know if my economic status would make that change. I don't know if something happened where I, where I adopted a dog or a kid or who, whatever. And that would change. I don't know. I don't know that that's too much in the future. But what I do know, again, is I like to uh, support people that are transparent and honest and rational. They're, they're here to help America, not divide America. But the problem is I don't think any politicians do that. So that's why I have an issue. But anyways, thank you. Thank you for the listener for sharing that. I think it's good perspective. And I, I just, um, 
I hope that people think about that a little bit. All right, good, Corey. So now we got we got a few more minutes here. Let's go to some headlines. All right, Jake. What to do with your money if you're worried about the market? Yeah, what a good headline, right? Mm-hmm. Some, some clickbait there for you. Very timely. <laughs> it is very timely. So this article, though, Corey, contains ideas of what to do when your account is already down, which I didn't. So it kind of teased you a little bit. So <laughs> what to do, though? Let's say your account is down. What do you do? Well, it's an opportunity to do a Roth IRA conversion, which means if you have money in an IRA and your stocks are down, you can move those into a Roth and pay taxes on that transaction. And then hopefully when your stocks rebound, all that rebound will come to you as tax-free growth. So that's, a, that's not a bad strategy. Again, this is not advice, something to consider. You can tax loss harvest, which means selling stocks in a brokerage account that are down to write them off your taxes potentially. You got to wait 30 days before you buy the stock back. So again, not always the best strategy, but something to think about. Or invest money. Again, the stock market's down. You got a lot of cash on the sidelines. Go ahead and put some in stocks. Maybe. Again, none of this is advice. Just some of the suggestions that the article made. But I want to discuss, Corey, what you should do if you're actually worried. And the article says that many advisors say, don't do anything, right? I, I, I hate that comment, by the way. I hate it when an advisor just says, buy and hold. Don't do anything. You know, it's like, well, that doesn't really help people, in my opinion. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I, and I, I don't like that either. So instead, here's what we do at Falcon Wealth Advisors. We say, revisit your financial plan and make sure your investments are aligned with your goals. That's what you should do if you're worried about your account. That's actually the number one thing you can do when you're worried about an account is go revisit your financial plan. And if you're still worried, after you meet with one of our planners and you review your plan, you might need further education on how your investments work. And this is my question to you, Corey. Do some people worry just to worry? Yes. <laughs> In my opinion. Elaborate on that. Give me your thoughts on that. I think the there's a lot of people that worry just to worry. I don't know how intentional it is for a lot of people, but I do think that people are bombarded with things to worry about. So I think it, it, there there's some people that it's just in their being, right? It's in their default. And it is, I, I think a lot of it probably boils down though, Jake, in my opinion, to an understanding of what you can really control and what you can change and what you can't. Because the more that I worry about something that I have zero influence or control over, just the more miserable I'm going to make myself. And there's nothing, there's no, there's no actions for me to ultimately take. I'm just worried. Yes, that's the problem. It's a problem. And I'll tell you, I I blame the media for this because the media's job is to get people to tune into their television show, their YouTube show, Instagram, read their article. And so they scare the heck out of people. And so we are constantly being bombarded, bombarded, constant stimulus of trying to get our fight or flight receptors on that when we're not in fight or flight mode, that worries us. So it's like, we feel most comfortable when we're worried because then that's how we're supposed to be. And I don't like that, you know? And so again, if you're worried about the market, your investments, and it's giving you this fight or flight, and everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? When you get a little, maybe a little anxious, maybe you get a little scared, you're a little mad, whatever. When you have that emotion trigger, you need to rise above it and say, is this just something Is there some stimulus that is creating this? What do I really have to worry about? And if you need some facts, let's go look at your financial plan. Let's go look at your investments and how they are aligned with that first before getting crazy and jumping to conclusions, right? And then if you're still worried, you need to understand how investments work. Because I I saw people from time to time, Corey, and again, it's not their fault. They don't do what we do for a living. My job is to educate them. But they will from time to time try to pick apart a portfolio Mm-hmm. They want all their stocks to be up all the time. And, you know, it doesn't work, it doesn't work that way. It is laughable. Yeah. It's a, a la- that's, all, that's like saying it should be 75 degrees every day, all day. And why is it not, Corey? Why does the weather change? Right? Mm-hmm. That's what that's saying when you say something. like when, when clients think their stock should be up all the time, that's what they're saying. It's absurd. And they have to realize that diversification, Corey, is so that you don't have to worry about that. You have to know things are going to be up and things are going to be down. And that's why you're diversified. 
And but people, I don't know why sometimes they don't get that. But again, that's our job. Educate, inform, go over it. I'll go over it again. I'll go over it again. I'll go over it again. That's, that's my job. I'm happy to do that. It doesn't bother me. But I just want people to understand you can't pick apart a portfolio. Just because one or two or 10 stocks are down doesn't mean you have a bad portfolio. It means you're diversified. That's what it means. So. Everything's up together. Everything may be down together too, which yes. is why we do that in the first place, right? Yes. I, yes, re- yes. Uh, real quick, Jake, the, uh, can we skip to the second article that I have queued up here? I think it's perfectly aligned with what we just talked about. Cool. Oh, so you want to move on. All right. Is it the overspending oh, I one? I thought you were getting ready to. Yes. Yes. All right, here we go. Corey, why am I overspending? Blame it on politics. I saw this, but I didn't read it. Okay. I just want to bring this back to what we were just talking about. Good. Because I think think it's very closely aligned. Go ahead. So first, I, I want to read a quote from the author of this article. Election fatigue has me and my friends so anxious that we find solace in buying more stuff than we should. This is what the author said. And this article, Jake, it attributes personal overspending to political exhaustion. And the words the author used were, after being besieged with nonstop breaking news, political ads, and memes from both sides of the political aisles, that when we get the chance to feel carefree, we snatch at the chance for distraction, even if it means disregarding our own spending limits. So this was suggesting that it's almost therapeutic for people because of politics to spend more money than they should. And my question is, how is disregarding your own personal spending limits gonna reduce your anxiety? Mm, yeah, this is bad. This is um, this is toxic. So this is why people overeat. This is why people binge drink and abuse drugs. Uh, shopping is another example of that. It when they do that, it's probably releasing some sort of dopamine mm-hmm. chemical in their brain. Believe it or not, that is making them feel better. It's almost like an addiction, right? So. They are shopping to turn off their brains and their brain is because their brain is overthinking, but it's bad. Right. <laughs> it's very bad. Yeah, that, well, that's the thing. I mean, it's, it, this says, why am I overspending? Blame it on politics. Like I, I, politics don't make me spend money. I, I choose how I spend money, not the politicians. Right. I mean, to an extent. So I guess I, to me, I just read this and it's like, yeah, that is a, I, I don't know what the, what the takeaway from that should be other than someone is just making the argument that it's okay to overspend because of our political environment. That doesn't make any sense to me. No, it doesn't. And again, it's a typical excuse that people make. And why don't you go work out because of politics? Right. Or why don't you eat fruits and vegetables because of politics? That's what I'd like to read that article. Yep. I exercise because of politics. That'd be awesome. Right. It would right. be awesome, actually. Let's that would do be something. Great I see. meditate because of politics. How about that Something one? healthy, yes. That'd be a good one. Very strange. But I just, I, I did want to bring that up because we were just talking about, you know, people being worried about their investments, being worried about the market, politics, yes. whatever it might be. The, I think the overarching theme here, and at least my perspective here is focusing on what it is that we can control. Like you said, Jake, going back to the financial plan, revisiting what the goals look like, understanding how the investment portfolio works, understanding your cash flow and where you're spending money bringing it back to what you can control. But if just being worried about the market and telling yourself it's okay to spend more money than you should because of the political environment, I don't know if that's going to be a recipe for success. No. And I've talked about this before on this show, but freedom isn't free. If you want to be right. free, you have to have accountability for yourself. Because that's I think that's the issue. People want their cake and, and they want to eat it too. It's like, you want your stocks to go up all the time, like, and you you want you know, it's just you want to be able to do whatever you want and everything work out. But you, there's there has to be there's accountability. Historically speaking, in the markets, investors who stay disciplined get rewarded, and people forget that. They think they're just supposed to make money no matter what, or they like this other article. They think they should just be able to buy whatever and blame it on somebody else. Discipline, <laughs> right. self accountability. Hmm. Those are virtuous things. Let's do those. What, what, and how much of a more fulfilling life, right? When you are self-disciplined and you can look back and you are healthy. You know, it's tough. And hopefully some people are, are getting that from the shows. Like that's what we want to inspire people to do, right? We want to educate. Right. So I'm glad that I'm credit to the credit to the people tuning in, Corey, that are watching Uptix or listening to Uptix. Yes. Hopefully they're educating themselves to, to be better. Good. We got time for one more, Corey. Let's do one more. All right, Jake. What is an expense ratio? Yeah, so kind of flipping the gear a little bit here. Mm-hmm. Talk about investment products. But an expense ratio, Corey, is an internal fee 
that you can't avoid when you buy mutual funds or index funds. And what makes it confusing, Corey, is it's quoted as a ratio, not a dollar amount. So you need to do the math on it, right? If you put a million dollars in a mutual fund and the mutual fund's expense ratio is 2.8%, what was that, $28,000 that you're paying that mutual fund every year. Now for us at Falcon Wealth Advisors, we don't like our clients paying these hidden fees to managers who know nothing about their financial plans. And that's really the, one of the core fundamentals of why we prefer not to use investment products. I understand that if XYZ Mutual Fund has a team of managers managing money, buying stocks and bonds for individual investors, that you need to pay those people. I understand that. What I don't agree with, Corey, is when advisors call themselves wealth advisors and they aren't managing the money. And then they, they charge a fee. So I don't like an advisor charging you a fee and then you have to pay a mutual fund company a fee. I don't like that. You're double paying. The advisor needs to be cut out in that situation. The problem though, is that the mutual fund's not gonna probably do financial planning for you. Right. So our solution to that is we are the money manager, we are the investment manager, and we do the financial planning all for one cost. That is something that sets us apart from a yes. lot of other wealth advisors. That's right. And our 800 clients in 35 states value that about us. And that's why we're very fortunate that our practice grows as quickly as it does. Because our clients, and thank you, thank you so much to our clients, will tell their friends, my advisors don't put me in products. That's why, that's why. Expense fees, you don't want expense ratios, you don't want to, you don't pay them and advise. If your advisor isn't qualified or capable of managing the money and you still need financial planning work, you should pay that advisor an hourly or project fee and then go put your money in a mutual fund. But you should not be paying that advisor a percentage of your assets when they're not managing the assets. That's we got on that, Corey. Anything else? No, I think you've covered it pretty well, Jake. And I, I, I just want to elaborate on one small point here. You, you've talked about what our clients value and the approach that we take. Again, we, we know that as far as investment returns go for anyone, that you know, ultimately any costs you pay are going to detract from that. So that's why we're very mindful of that. And Jake, you and I have worked together. I've worked with you for 14, almost 15 years now. And that, of course, is what we want to be mindful of for our clients. And I think that Oftentimes people just don't understand if they're paying two layers or two levels of, of costs for investment management. Ultimately, that takes away from how your portfolio returns look. So being scrutinizing and understanding what that is is really important and recognizing, Jake, I'm glad that you brought this up and we talked about it on the show, is that if an advisor is charging you an asset management fee and they are not charging the ass and they're not managing the assets, then why are you paying them that way? Right. It's good. Right. All right, good, Corey. And the last point I wanted to make here, I skipped over it, is that I wanted to mm -hmm. uh, put out there that we are having a pickleball social, right, Corey? That's right. Pickleball social on October 3rd at six o'clock. Fifth clients annual. Are annual. Fifth, Fifth annual, annual, right? Yep. Fifth annual. And clients are invited and they're welcome to bring a friend. Corey, I think last year we had 100 people. We did. So if you want details of the event, please email Luke at falconwealthadvisors.com and Luke will make sure you get the details. We give giveaways. Hopefully we'll have a band. We'll have food and drink. I'm not going to be playing pickleball, Corey. I'm a golfer. I know you're a paddle guy, but it's also kind of you're hosting the event. So I don't know if you're going to get to play. I bet you end up out on the court, but we'll see. I'm sure I probably will, but I, uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to hosting the event and seeing everybody there. Yes, so are we. So October 3rd, Put on your calendar, email Luke at falconwealthadvisors.com and Luke will give you the details. Thank you again, Corey, for joining me and thank you all for tuning in. We hope you have a great week. Thank you for listening to Upticks. Click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes become available. Also, be sure to visit our website, falconwealthadvisors.com and click the contact us button if you'd like to meet with Jake and his team.